Hello there. Right now, I'd be very worried if I was driving an electric car. There was a story a couple of days ago about the potential for the Chinese to grind our traffic to a halt by selling us loads of their cheap electric cars that they could remotely immobilise all at the same time. But to do that, we'd need to be buying hundreds of thousands of Chinese EVs, and that alone would be damaging for our economy. But the problem for the Chinese might become how to get them here in the first place. In a ship, I hear people cry. But in early 2022, a massive 200-metre-long cargo ship, the Felicity Ace, suffered a huge blaze that lasted for days and she eventually lost stability and sank in the Atlantic Ocean. Thankfully, the crew were safely evacuated, but it transpires the vessel was chock-a-block full of luxury cars, 3,965 of them. 1100 from Porsche alone. That was about £295 million worth of Porsches, Audis, Bentleys and Lamborghinis, amongst others like a 1977 Land Rover Santana. But it was also carrying electric vehicles. And although not proven, there is a strong suspicion that a lithium car battery was involved. And once one of those gets going, just about the only thing you can do is wait for it to burn itself out because it feeds itself with oxygen while it burns. And the fire is so fierce it spreads very easily while releasing toxic fumes. And that fire knocked out not only the nearly 300 million quids worth of expensive cars, it also put paid to a 30 plus million pound cargo ship. Potentially one defective car battery did all that. And this year we have the Fremantle Highway, now positioned off the coast of the Netherlands, having itself suffered a calamitous fire. And this time one sailor sadly lost their life. And its cargo? Electric vehicles. 3,783 cars, of which 498 are, or probably more accurately were, battery powered. And once again, a lithium battery fire appears to be the most likely culprit. And once again, the cargo and ship will both be hugely damaged. And as a result, some freight carriers are now refusing to carry electric vehicles. And not only that, I wonder how much it would cost to insure any vessel engaged in transporting electric cars going forwards. And would the crew want danger money? The sea can be very unforgiving at the best of times, but add a potential fire like this into the mix and it would make the situation considerably worse. And heavy weather at sea can end up dislodging cargo. And if there is another of these incidents, I wonder what cargo carrier companies would have to do to be able to carry EVs, what new safety stuff they'd need. Or if any carriers could be found to take them should they be deemed the cause of any future cargo ship or ferry fires. Given that when dealing with an EV after it's been involved in a collision, mechanics have to follow special procedures and take many precautions to minimise the effect of a potential car battery fire. So you could imagine what would be needed in a ship where the tighter a cargo is packed, the more you can carry. How many EVs could you carry if a clear area of 15 metres radius was enforced around each EV, like the rules for damaged EVs in a car repair shop? So that if one went up it would not affect the other cars and the ship. Or maybe only a limited number of them could be carried within specially constructed compartments or inside special crates. And how long before such safety requirements were imposed on all EVs, on ferries for example, and the Channel Tunnel? And you only have to search for lithium battery fires to see it is not an infrequent thing. From cars to scooters, they self-immolate and sometimes explode. And five days ago, New York City Fire Department Commissioner Laura Kavanagh testified about the dangers these batteries pose.
saying that e-bike and e-scooter batteries have caused 131 fires in New York City so far this year, causing many injuries and 13 fatalities. Lithium-ion batteries are now a top cause of fatal fires in New York, she said. And closer to home, the London Fire Brigade tells us that last year they attended over 116 fires involving e-scooters and e-bikes. The majority of fires related to e-bikes and e-scooters have happened in homes. These fires are often caused when charging batteries. Now, cars using nickel metal hydride batteries are safer than those using lithium iron batteries in this regard. But they don't operate at as high a voltage, nor do they store as much energy. They also have a higher self discharge rate, meaning they can go flat quite fast when not in use, as well as being sensitive to high and low temperatures. And solid state batteries are still in development. So lithium iron is still the battery of choice for most EV manufacturers. And the latest battery technology from China is the lithium iron manganese phosphate battery or LMFP. Now last month I made a video talking about a report from Thatcham Research warning of higher insurance premiums for electric cars to come because of the excessive costs involved in repairing them. And it also said that collisions involving an EV were often catastrophic for the vehicle, i.e. a total write-off, even from a minor crunch, because of the risk of a potentially damaged battery. Are we about to see substantial added costs from transporting these things around the world as well? And if they are limited in any way regarding transport by sea, then each country will be forced to build more of them themselves, but not for export. But then comes the battery bit. If an EV is a risk because of the battery, then what risk would a cargo ship chock full of batteries pose, especially in heavy weather? Another reason why we need to import the raw materials and make the batteries here as well. And that's one thing we are trying to do. And why? Well, according to Sky News, batteries constitute most of the value of the finished product, and since they're heavy and volatile, car manufacturers don't like to transport them very far before putting them in their finished cars. So that's completely different to petrol and diesel, then, that we can transport around the country into the forecourts all over the place. But the manufacturers are then happy for us to drive thousands of miles sat on top of their batteries. Now, I came across an electric vehicle charging risk insight from Zurich Resilient Solutions, and reading that was uh, interesting. It talks about charging units and charging parking areas being as far from important buildings, structures and utilities as possible. And it makes it sound like installing one in your garage or driveway close to your house would be a very foolhardy thing to do. Internal charging stroke parking areas should be in a separate fire compartment with a minimum of 60 minutes fire resistance subject to consideration of the hazards presented by the occupation of the building, it says makes it sound like the last place you should be charging an EV is anywhere near where you and your family live, eat and sleep. And before anyone says similar rules apply to petrol station forecourts, I would point out that apart from the odd gallon can of fuel, the ordinary driver does not have a petrol pump and underground storage on their property. And with the way the electric car system is meant to work, by using car batteries that are plugged into the grid as an extra reserve energy source when needed, we'd have millions of car batteries charging and discharging overnight in people's garages every single night. <laughs>